immortal, invisible to the King, eternal to the only wise God. To the King, eternal, immortal, invisible to the King, eternal to the only wise God. Good morning. How's your week? Good? Good week? Okay. Good. Well, some of us had a good week. Uh, I know CB had a good week. He's been fishing down Lake Okeechobee and he sent me pictures, and that's a dirty pool, let me tell you right now. And uh, Lonnie Gibson sent me picture, uh, fishing pictures this week, and that's a dirty pool. But uh, we are glad that you're here uh, today. We're going to have a great day today. Uh, I'm going to speak out of Matthew chapter 6 today. Uh, the essentials for every believer. And Jesus says some specific things uh, to each and every one of us who, who claim to know Christ. And uh, we're going to look at that this morning. Uh, what ha how, did, how did the week go? Uh, the fasting, how, how did it go? Is it doing okay? You hanging in there? Uh, anybody stepped out of the kingdom off the wagon during the week? 
Uh, I hope that you're praying and, uh, and that you are fasting. And You know, it's like I told a group the other night, if, if, if we'll just draw a circle around us during these 21 days, and we'll say, God, just do whatever needs to happen inside that circle. Uh, because the truth of, of the matter is, uh, there are things in all of our lives that God could work on, that God can change, that God can fix. And uh, you know what? If, if God answers that prayer during these 21 days, this whole place is transformed just like that. And so I hope that you're praying. The other thing is this. Last Sunday, these cards were available out front, okay? Uh, the 21st, Friend Day. And uh, our goal is to make 3,000 touches in the city in 21 days. Uh, if you got out the door without some of these last week, let me encourage you to grab some. Uh, the thing that has surprised me this week is when you're just intentional, it is amazing the opportunities that God gives you when you're looking for the opportunities. And uh, there are so many people out there, and I've talked with so many people this week, and they are receptive, and they are kind, and they are appreciative. And so let me challenge you just to do this right now. Uh, during these next, we've got two more weeks. Uh, we've got this week and then another week. And uh, we can make those 3,000 touches uh, in 21 days. Now, to you that are our guests, we are so glad that you're here. We have some friends of ours uh, from Jacksonville that drove in uh, today uh, to be with us, uh, Kim and David Troutman. I'm glad that they're here. It's always good to see them. And uh, there are others that are here that I've had the opportunity to speak to this morning. Thank you for coming <laughs> and being a part of our time together. Right now, what I want everyone to do is this. Turn around. Find somebody that you haven't spoken to, and when you're talking, tell them how many touches you made this week, all right? Have a good week. sing together.
We come to worship you today, Lord. We recognize your holiness and your goodness. And in the midst of that, we also recognize our brokenness and our need for you. Hear our song as we worship you and as we sing to you today.
sense right now your presence as you move throughout this place. We honor you and we recognize you as the king, as the boss. We open up our lives and we yield to you today. We seek you and we seek your word and your voice in our life and in our circumstances. Speak through Pastor Lee, I pray. and Do something great in our midst. We pray in your name. Amen. Let's be seated together. Matthew chapter 6. Parents, uh, suppose your teenage child uh, is especially nice, they're respectful. I mean, they clean their room, they do what they are asked to do. Uh, they don't whine, they don't gripe, they don't complain. Uh, and they come and they offer extra to do extra. Uh, so some of you are smiling already. You say, all right, I already, I already smell a rat because uh, that doesn't happen oftenly. But suppose they do it. And then suppose that evening they come and, uh, and they ask you if they can attend a late night event and they know that you don't normally allow them to do that in the first place, but uh, they come and they ask you uh, if, they were, if they can go and you discover something. You discover that they're doing the right thing all day long, but they're doing it for selfish reasons. You know, the same thing happens in our relationship with God. Uh, we can do the right things that Christians ought to do, but it's possible to do the right thing with the wrong motive, with the wrong reason. Uh, I want you to ask yourself a series of questions this morning. Why do I attend church? I mean, why do you come? What's the motive for your coming today? What is the reason for you being here? Um, why do you attend church? I mean, is it because you love God and you want to worship Him? You want to learn how to be a better Christian? Or, or do we attend church, I mean, to please our family members uh, and hoping that things are going to get better at home, uh, that we'll be more successful in our careers? Or, or do we attend uh, just to be with friends? Uh, why do you go to church? Why do you give to the church. I mean, do you give because you love God, because you want to support the work, because you want to meet needs, or, or do you give so that you can get the tax deduction at the end of the year? Uh, do you give to impress others by the size uh, of your gift? You see, why should this even concern us? Why does why we come, why we give, why we do what we do, I mean, why does it even concern us? I mean, if you do righteous deeds for self-centered reasons, that may reveal that you have the same problems that Jesus is talking about in this text of Scripture. It may reveal that you're a hypocrite. It may reveal that you do it just for the outward show and not as an expression of your inward faith, your inward heart, your inner faith life. Uh, another problem with selfish ambition is, is that it can rob you of the eternal reward for doing the right thing. What we're going to learn today is this. There are a lot of people that do the right things for the wrong reason. They don't get any eternal credit for that. They don't get any eternal reward for that. The only reward they get is in the here and the now. And so let me talk to you about some essentials for every believer, regardless of where you are in your maturity in Christ, regardless of where you are in your walk with the Lord, I want to talk to you today about essentials that you need to take, I need to take, we need to plug them into our lives, and they need to be examined. Matthew chapter 6, stand with me as we give honor to the reading of God's Word. 
Jesus is speaking here and he says, Beware of practicing your righteous deeds before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise you have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have the reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your hand know what the right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your inner room, Close your door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Verse 16, Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have the reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your feet, uh, your face, so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Uh, Father, today do the thing that only you can do. Speak into our hearts. Connect with our lives. And help us to evaluate where we really are in these essentials. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning we're going to look back at the text of Scripture and we're going to see what Jesus has to say about the issue of motivation. Uh, but first, let me lay the foundation by the subject by considering something. First of all, we are commanded to practice righteousness. Look at, in verse 1, Jesus mentions the practice of what he calls righteous deed. I believe that's the way it should be uh, translated. James says that faith without works is what? Dead. A and a Christian really ought to be about doing righteous deeds. Uh, and so in this text of Scripture, Jesus mentions there are three that are commonly practiced upon the Jews and, and were commended by the Lord. And, and I want us to look at these as examples and see where we are in our practice of these righteous deeds. First of all, there's the command to give. In verse 2, uh, notice that, that Jesus does not say, if you do charitable deeds, but when you do charitable deeds. You see, Jesus assumed that, that God's people are going to give. Here's the question. Do you? Do you? Do you give? You see, by nature, we're more interested in getting than giving. Uh, we like to receive more than we like to give a lot of times. But when you're born again with a new nature, something happens in your life, and when you become a new creation in Christ, you learn to give. And every Christian needs to learn the grace of giving. Here's the thing. Giving is a God activity. Think about all that God gives. He gives compassion. He gives mercy. He gives love. He gives forgiveness. He gives salvation. He gives promises. He gives security. I mean, there are so many things that God gives, and when we give, it is a God activity that we are involved in in our lives. We're most like Jesus when we give. But notice the particular kind of giving indicated here. Literally it means, it says this, whenever you practice. Now that, that phrase right there in the Greek is in the present term. In other words, you're doing it right now. Whenever you practice acts of mercy. In other words, whenever you see someone who is in need, from a merciful heart, you meet that need in that person's life. And so giving to the poor was a law demanded uh, uh, by God. Uh, Exodus chapter 23, the exhortations of the prophets. Uh, Jeremiah 22, the teachings of Jesus. Matthew 7. And, and here's the thing. 
the Jews gave the tithe. Uh, Jews never debated tithing. I mean, settled issue. 10% goes to the Lord. And we tithe, uh, the Jews tithe because they supported the, the scribes, the priests, they supported the temple, they supported everything that went on in and around that work. And so they gave their tithes. But giving to the poor was considered praiseworthy. Uh, we're told in Scripture to give tithes and what? Offerings. Uh, a lot of people just struggle with the tithe part. They never get around to the offering part. They're still trying to get over the hurdle of the tithe part. And so we're told to, to give tithes and offerings. And so we give there's the command to give. The command to give is to meet the need. When the need is there, you see it. When the need is there, you have a heart to meet it. At the close of the service this morning, when you walk out the doors, the ushers are going to be standing there with, a, with an offering plate, and we're going to take a benevolence offering. Now, don't give your regular offering to that. This is above your tithe. This is an offering that is praiseworthy, the Bible says. Uh, you wouldn't believe how many phone calls we get every week up here. I mean, people that have lost their jobs, people that are trying to feed their kids, people that are trying to keep their electricity turned on. I mean, people that, that need help, people that get stranded out here on the interstate and, and, and they need assistance, they need help. And so we're going to give a benevolence offering this morning. And, and let me ask you something. How often do you give to that kind of an offering? How, how often do you give toward benevolence? We're not talking about tithes. We're talking about offerings. I mean, would you give to help a family that's in need? I hope that you're a giver. So there's a command to give. But secondly, there's a command to pray. Look at verse number 5. Jesus says, and when you do what? Pray. Here again... Jesus assumes something. He assumes you're already praying. It's one of the most important things we do as a believer. And how can a person know the Lord? How can a person know the Lord and say, you know what, I, I really don't talk to the Lord. How can you know Him and not talk to Him? You see, prayer is so important. Nine, in verses 9 through 13, Jesus taught us how to pray by giving an example of the kind of prayer that we, that we need to do. Let me ask you a question. Do you pray on a regular basis? Uh, do you pray more than at meals and at church or when you're in trouble? Uh, I can't emphasize enough the prayer life of our church. 21 days of prayer and fasting. Why do we do this? We're doing it to focus on God and to hear the voice of God and to connect with the heart of God and ask God to transform us, change us, and make us into all that we need to be during this time. Do you pray? You know, if we would just grasp this one, if we'd just begin to pray more as a church, pray more uh, as individuals, I mean, we'd see more souls saved, more lives changed. We'd do greater things in the church if, if, if His people, God's people, would just pray with the right heart and pray more often. I mean, we ought to have more people show up at prayer meetings. I mean, in Baptist Church, you have a prayer meeting that I think when you announce that, the majority of the people says, oh, we don't go to that. We don't attend that. We attend worship. We attend life group. Uh, we attend uh, cookouts. We attend fellowships. But now nah, I don't have time to go to prayer meetings. Every Sunday morning I meet with a group of men. We've invited all the men in the church. You know how I many we had this morning? We had six. We had six gather for prayer this morning, to pray for the services, pray for the church, pray that God would do something in the realm of the supernatural. And Jesus said, we don't have it because we haven't asked for it. I want to invite you men to come. Tell you what, some of you have told me, you know, 745 is too early. I'll tell you what we'll do then. I'll move it to 815 next week just for you. 815, come and join us, men. 
I mean, we'd be right over here in room 106. And I mean, it'd be awesome next week if we couldn't get, ever, get the men in the room because the men of this church have a heart to pray. Do you pray outside of the dinner table, outside of the Sunday school class, the life group, outside of the times when you're in trouble? Do you even pray at all? How can you know God and never talk to Him? But then there's a third command. We're commanded to fast. Uh, verse number 16, Jesus says this, and when you fast. You see, praying is, uh, is important. Fasting is a form of self-denial. It's, it's an experience where you deny yourself something in a physical realm in order to achieve something in a spiritual realm. Fasting is a period of time when you detach yourself from earthly things and you attach yourself to the things of God. You know the only fast that was imposed on the Jews uh, was that of the Day of Atonement, Leviticus chapter 16. But there's other notable fasts in the Bible, Exodus chapter uh, 34, Moses. And it's often an expression of national repentance. Uh, there was a time, in the time of Jesus, a lot of the Jews fasted twice a week. They fasted Monday, they fasted Thursday. Jesus fasted 40 days before he went into the temple, I mean into the wilderness. The early church uh, practiced fasting from time to time. The apostle Paul commended fasting. And so while with the passing of the Day of Atonement, fasting was not a requirement any longer. So here's the question. Is fasting a New Testament concept? Is fasting for New Testament Christians? Yes. But it's not commanded, it's voluntary. It's private. But here's the thing, most Christians don't fast. That's my Wednesday night Bible study. How many of you have never fasted before? Right, lift your hand. Let me, let me just see your hand. How many of you have never fasted before? And, and over half of my Bible study on Wednesday night had never fasted. I think we create that as Baptists. We got to eat. I mean, we're going to eat. We have a gathering. We got to feed them, right? We got to feed them to get them there. And, and so we're, we, we've got to, we're going to eat. So, I mean, we have huge turnouts for uh, fish fries and barbecues and, and, and all kinds of Christmas parties and special dinners like that. Uh, but we enjoy eating. But here's the thing. Fasting is important sometimes because of a spiritual emphasis, because we need personal revival, personal renewal in our life. Fasting is appropriate in conjunction with an exterior time of repentance and prayer. I think it's something that serious Christians need to take another look at, at least occasionally. I know the thing that I've prayed for this week, just what I told you earlier, uh, I'm praying for 21 days, God send revival to that circle right there. I'm not worried about anybody else. My focus is on you and on me during this 21 days. And God, do what needs to be done inside that small circle right there. Send revival inside that circle. I don't have time to focus on Larry. I don't have the energy to focus on Scotty. I've got my hands full focusing on me and what God needs to do in my life and in me and in what God wants to accomplish through me. We ought to look at it. Well, there's other religious deeds that we, that we ought to practice. I mean, a lot of Christians practice daily Bible reading, weekly church attendance, serving uh, in one or more ministries of the church. Uh, but here's the question. How many of these righteous deeds do you practice? And if you love Jesus, does it even show in your life? I mean, can people look at you and do they see the righteous deeds that you're doing? And so Christ commands righteous deeds. Secondly, uh, we must constantly evaluate our motives. Evaluate our motives. Verse number one, Christ gives uh, the general principle here. He says, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Now, the, the original language there indicates that, that we don't do righteous deeds for the purpose of being seen by others. And here is the issue of motivation. I mean, we should do righteous deeds, but we should not do them for everyone 
or for the express purpose of being seen, for the purpose of being praised, for the purpose of being acknowledged. Furthermore, the word translated, notice there, the Greek word theomai. We get our word theater from that word. Do you do religious deeds only when you are being watched? Is the only time you pray, is the only time you give, is the only time you fast, is the only time you do spiritual deeds is when people are watching. You're like a person on a stage performing a play and you hope for applause. The issue is here is, is not that we should never do anything publicly. In chapter 5 verse 16, Jesus commanded us to do your good works before men. The issue is motivation. And if we're not careful, we do our righteous deeds for the applause of men rather than to please God. If nobody ever thanked you, if nobody ever acknowledged you, if nobody ever recognized you, would it change the way that you practice your righteousness? Why do you do what you do in the first place? Do you do it for the applause of man or do you do what you do to please God? Do you pray because you want to know God and you want God to know you? Do you give because it is a God activity and we're most like God when we give? Do we fast because we want to be drawn closer to God? Or do we do what we do to be noticed and to be applauded? strikes at the heart of motive. And Jesus said this is especially the case of the hypocrite. There, three times in the text of Scripture, Jesus refers to the practice of the hypocrites of his day. Uh, uh, the English word there comes from the Greek word hypocrypti, which was used in... in in, in, in that day for a Greek play actor who would hold a mask in front of his face on a stage in a play to play the part of someone else. You see, the point is that there are some people who do religious deeds, but let me tell you what it is. Show. It's all it is, show. They do what they do because they want to be seen. They do what they do because they want to be noticed. They do what they do because they want the applause of men. They do what they do for the wrong motive. You see, they do not do them out of love of God or out of a love for their fellow man. They do what they do because they love themselves and they want others to love them. They love the practice. They love the praise. They love the recognition that they get from, from doing the outward deeds. And, and, and these kind of hypocrites demonstrate that you don't have to become a Christian on the inside to act like one on the outside. Jesus said, there'll be many standing before me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't I cast out demons in your name? Didn't I... Do miracles in your name? Did not do this in your name, that in your name? And Jesus said, you did, but depart from me because I never knew. On the outside, look like a Christian, sound like a Christian, walk like a Christian. On the inside, the motive of their heart was not right. And so in this text, Jesus gives three illustrations of religious hypocrites who do religious deeds from a selfish motivation. And we need to make sure that... that that we don't see ourselves in these examples. And if we do, we need to question the reality and the sincerity of our faith. First of all, beware of giving with the wrong motive. Uh, so when you give, Jesus said in verse number 2, give to the poor. Do not sound the trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. I mean, why does Christ... Uh, 
why does he refer to this sounding of a trumpet? It, it may have been the custom of the day in the street of Jerusalem uh, to blow a literal trumpet right before they gave to the poor. Uh, although the alleged purpose was to call the poor and the needy uh, together to receive a gift, it, it afforded an opportunity for others to see the good works that were being done. Or it could be symbolic language for the fact that they did everything in their power to advertise their gifts. I can just imagine, in my mind's eye, a wealthy man walking out into the streets of Jerusalem uh, to find some poor beggars. And instead of giving to meet the need, he sends someone ahead to announce to the beggar, hey, so-and-so is coming, and they're going to make a generous donation to you. A, they're going to give you a generous gift. And he draws the crowd to the scene. And when the rich man gives, his advanced man leads the crowd and applaud. And that kind of giving is just buying recognition. So whatever is the exact meaning, they wanted to call attention to their giving. That meant that they want glory from men. I had a deacon in a former church years ago that was a key giver. And the people in the church knew that, that he gave generously. And anytime we would have a, a pledge for a building program or anything like that, I mean, he would pledge and he would share with others what he was doing. And so he always gave his money. He was always a generous giver until we had a vote and he stood in opposition of the vote. And when the church voted, they voted against him. And guess what he did? He quit giving. Now, do you think the motive for his giving was, was exposed? Yeah. Why do you give? I mean, I've told you before, I don't give a dime to Mabel White. I don't give a dime. If I gave because I agreed with everything, if I gave because I was happy with everything, if I gave because I liked everything, if I gave... I mean, I could go on and on and on if those were the reasons that I were to give, but if that's the reason why I, I, I were to give, guess what? I could justify not giving much. And so in my giving, my giving is not focused on the church. My giving is focused to a holy God. And so when I come and, and I bring my gift and I lay it before the Lord, I am giving my gift to God and not to man. Any man, every man, will disappoint you. Hardy can look at me and he won't have to look too far to find something wrong with me. I can look at you and I won't have to look too far to find something wrong with you. We're all cracked pots. Cracked pots. That's us. But let me tell you something about cracked pots. The Bible says that 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 that, that our faith, that the gospel produces sincerity in our life. And that word in the Greek is an interesting word. It's, it's the Greek word sincere. And in Bible times, uh, the potter would put the clay on the wheel and he'd begin to form the pot and, and he would make the pot and then he would take the pot off the wheel and he would take it outside and he would set it in the sun and the sun would bake the pot. And as that clay began to contract cracks would come in the pot. And after the pot was dry, the pot maker, the, the potter would take the pot, he would hold it up to the sun, and he would put his eyes there, and he would look in to see where the cracks were. And then he would take beeswax, and he would rub down the outside of that pot. He would rub it in and he would smear it around and, and then he would reach on the inside of that pot and, and he, would, he would rub it all in on the inside of that pot. And then after that, was, that process was completed, he would take it out and hold it up to the sun again to make sure all the cracks had been filled. And when there were no more cracks, 
they would say that the pot was sincere. Friend, aren't you thankful that God does a sincere work in our life when the gospel is applied to our, our hearts and our life? That when God takes our life and He holds it up to the Son, the Son of God, and He looks because of the sincerity of our faith, <laughs> all the cracks are filled in. In Christ, there is no condemnation. You see, giving is a God activity. And we don't withhold our giving from God and be in right relationship with Him. You see, I don't know many people today that would, seek, that would blatantly seek publicity regarding their giving. But it does make a difference to you if people know. I mean, do you place your offering envelope face up or face down in the offering plate? Uh, do you tend to give more when people know about your gift? If so, your motive is probably not as pure as it ought to be. But then he says, beware of praying with the wrong motive. He says, when you pray... You're not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street. Uh, perhaps they would arrive at the synagogue early. They would stand near the entrance uh, and, and they would pray as people arrived or, or they would go into the streets to pray. Interesting thing in this passage of Scripture, the word street in verse number 2 means a narrow street. It means an alley uh, between buildings, which was common in cities and, and towns of that time. But verse 5, the word street, is a completely different word. It means a wide way. In other words, uh, they would stand praying along the busy street. They stood and they prayed where they could be seen and heard by as many people as possible. They probably prayed with uplifted hands. Uh, why would they pray at those kind of locations? You see, Jesus could see right into the, the motivation of their heart. They were doing it to appear more righteous and receive commendation and to receive praise for their holiness. Now, here's the thing. Scripture doesn't condemn public prayer. I mean, nowhere in Scripture does it say don't pray in public. Uh, it, it's just not there. Uh, it doesn't say don't pray in worship. It doesn't say don't pray before a public meeting or event. In fact, I think it's an awesome thing that these teenagers every year, I mean, on their own, gather around a flagpole out in front of their school, and as followers of Christ, they gather around the flagpole, they join hands, and they pray for their school. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. But what is condemned is prayer with a motivation being seen and praised by men. He's condemning having your personal prayer time in a public place with the intention of being seen and honored by people. And if you pray in public, but you pray very little in private, you need to examine your motive. The only time you pray is at church. The only time you pray is in a gathering of believers. And there's no private prayer going on in your life. You really need to step back and evaluate. Why am I praying in the first place? And then beware of fasting with the wrong motive. He says, whenever you fast, don't put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect the appearance so that they may be noticed by men when they are fasting. You see, if a person is fasting, I mean, how would anybody know that you're fasting except those who would eat with you regularly? And so they come up with a way to advertise that they were fasting. Well, it's not spiritual to go around and tell everybody that I'm fasting in my personal life. Now look, there's two different things here. We're talking about a corporate thing here as a church, but here Jesus is talking about an individual thing. I mean, we ought to fast as a church. We ought to pray as a church and seek the face of God as a church. But as individuals, I mean, there ought to be seasons in our life where we pray and we fast and we seek the face of God individually. And so how is somebody going to know if you're fasting unless they eat with you on a regular basis? And so they came up with ways. Uh, they would go around with a sad countenance. Uh, they would go around with even disfigured face. 
They'd go around groaning from hunger, making sure that people knew what a great sacrifice they were making for the Lord. Why is that? They hoped that people would look at them and say, boy, how godly, how dedicated. I have to admit something. In the past when I fasted, I've been tempted to moan and groan about it. I've had a pretty easy week this week. Now, next week, I mean, I may just get flat body slammed next week. But this week I've had a pretty easy week. And usually in time I fasted, day three is the worst. It's about day three that your body starts screaming at you, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. And so day three is hard. I've been tempted before, I mean, to, uh, to talk about it, to, to let everybody know what I'm doing. But, but I didn't do it. You just need to live as normally as possible. So I hope that these illustrations we, we've talked about give you a clear picture of the kind of impure motives we, we need to avoid. If we attend church, if we pray, if we give, if we serve in the church, motivated by, by a desire to be seen and applauded and noticed, then your motives are self-centered rather than God-centered. We're going to stop there because i got two more points and y'all don't want to stay to 1 o'clock. So you have to come back next week and get a second half, okay? Let me ask you something. Is it hot here to y'all? Yes. And I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm sweating like nobody's business. Here's the deal. What kind of giver are you? The Bible says God loves... Hilarious givers. I mean, we ought to be so excited, we ought to be downright giddy when we have an opportunity to give. I've talked about it before. The, the deadest time, in it, and, we, and we do better here, but the deadest time in most churches is the offering. I mean, the only thing missing is the casket <laughs> down front. That's the only thing that's missing in the average church when it comes time to give. You talk about giving, people get angry when you talk about giving. Jesus said more about giving than he did heaven and hell. Why do you give? Do you give? Why do you pray anyhow? When do you pray? How do you pray? Is the only time you pray here? Is the only time you pray around the dinner table? Why do you pray? How can you say you know God when you never talk to Him outside of your blessing? Why do you fast? I don't know if you caught what Jesus said. He said this, when you pray, not if you pray. When you give, not if you give. When you fast, not if you fast. Those are essentials for every believer. Pray with me. Lord, today you have shown us clearly in your word what we need to do as believers. You've shown us today, Father, that you desire relationship with us, you want to talk to us, and you want us to talk to you with a motive of just knowing you. that we're to give. And Lord, not give with a grudge and not hold back because of anything, but that we give because you're a great God and you've blessed us. Lord, you've, you've told us to fast, to disconnect from the world of physical life and to connect with the spiritual world. What kind of giver are you? What kind of pray, praying person are you? What kind of a fasting life have you had? In just a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to sing. We do this morning. Glenn and Rob are, are going to be here. And 
If you've never trusted Jesus, you see, you can go through all the motions and all the deeds of righteousness, but unless you've got it in your heart, it doesn't matter. You don't get eternal credit for it. That's what we'll talk about next week. You can receive Christ today. Just come to, come to them this morning and say, I want to give my heart my life to Jesus. And we have some folks that will talk with you and pray with you about it. Believer, where are you in these essentials? As we stand this morning seeing sing this altar is open, you can come this morning and say, you know, God, circle around me. Do what needs to happen inside that circle. Strengthen my prayer life. Strengthen my giving. Strengthen my searching for you. And then others may be searching for a church to belong to. We'd like to invite you to come here and join us here at Mabel White. Come to Glenn or, or Bobby and just say, hey, we want to join the church and we have some folks that will talk with you. Lord Jesus, have your way today in our hearts and our lives. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and we're going to sing. Say